We have an excellent speaker coming up here. Uh, she's a privacy engineer, and she's also a movie buff. Or I think there was another nerd. nerd. Okay no, I, I, you know, I wanted to make sure I caught that right. Um, and I hear she also likes memes. I heard that. So Kaylee is going to be with us, uh, talking to us uh, about a lot of privacy concerns. As a privacy engineer, she knows a lot about them. And of course, every every talk we give, we ask you please mute your cell phones. Uh, these sessions are being broadcast online, and they're saved for posterity on YouTube. Uh, also, of course, please, if you haven't, we're, our vendors, our sponsors, rather. Our sponsors are here for a short time still. So after this talk, then go see your, our sponsors. So I'm gonna turn it over because I wanna hear all about how I need a bigger boat. Hi, thank you guys so much for sticking around for the home stretch of the Diana Initiative 2022. Uh, I'm Kaylee, I'm a privacy engineer at Confiant. And this talk is, you're gonna need a bigger boat building technical solutions to ethical problems. So I wanted to start off by sharing a quick story. So one of the first tickets that I worked on when I first became a software engineer was cleaning up the consequences of a pretty serious privacy bug, a glitch with a barcode scanner that was being used to match hard copy files to files in the database caused some very sensitive PII from some accounts to be merged into other accounts. Um, and this is already a pretty big privacy nightmare, but making matters worse is the fact that a couple of the tickets in this batch were escalated. One of them was a woman who had her current address and phone number merged into the account of her estranged ex-husband against whom she had a restraining order. So this glitch exposed a domestic violence survivor to more danger and more trauma. Uh, we were able to remove the exposed information, but we'll never know if we did that in time um, and how much harm this ultimately did. And this ticket has haunted me ever since. Um, and I don't know who is responsible for creating that bug, it doesn't really matter. What I do know is that no one realized the harm that that tool could cause until it did. And that, that also haunts me. And then when I started getting involved in voter outreach for the 2020 elections and seeing all the fancy tools and databases that campaigns and their consultants were using to reach out to voters, it dawned on me that if I were that woman and I knew how my contact information would be exposed to any volunteer who showed up with little to no screening whatsoever, would I register to vote? Um, so do we do enough to inform voters of that before they register to access what is a fundamental civil right? Um, even, even well-intentioned tech tools like these can cause some pretty serious ethical tensions and consequences. But in some cases, especially in privacy and security technology, we're trying to steer straight into that chaos um, and to be part of the solution. And that's why I wanted to give this talk, that chaos, it's difficult to navigate and the stakes are so high. And I don't think we talk about what that means and how to do it well nearly enough. So a few years after that experience, I'm now a privacy engineer at Conviant, and we are out here trying to build those tools that offer solutions to ethical problems. I was a software engineer for about five years. Um, I worked for some federal contractors, uh, did a little bit of malware analysis in there somewhere, and then I worked for an organization that mobilizes voters for voter outreach during elections. Um, and I am just a huge all-around nerd. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is very specific to privacy and cybersecurity, but I think that these issues impact engineers across many specialties and industries. Engineers make decisions that affect accessibility, or alienate users whose identities do not fit neatly into a standard form or get bounced back by standard form validations. 
They build dark patterns, which are UI design choices that manipulate users into taking actions that run contrary to their own intentions or best interests. And just because you aren't a privacy or security engineer doesn't mean that you aren't building a site or app that is subject to CCPA or GDPR notice and consent requirements and all of the portability and deletion and access requirements that come with those. Um, and then there are some increasingly specific rules for fintech and health tech solutions. Um, so, and I mean, that's only for the US and Europe. There are a host of other countries that are coming out with their own requirements. And so being an engineer is getting increasingly complicated and regulated. Um, and we're not trained at all on how to navigate that. Um, sometimes engineers are lucky enough to have the support of other specialized teams or team members um, to navigate that, but so many do not. And so many of these choices get pushed to production without anybody even thinking about the legal and ethical implications. So some more context for me. Confiant is, we're a cybersecurity startup. We're in the ad tech space. And last year, we started to build a privacy compliance product to help publishers and platforms see what ad tech vendors and advertisers were tracking on their pages and whether or not they had the necessary content, consent to remain compliant. So we're working with the CCPA compliance, GDPR compliance. So we're taking very new laws that are still being interpreted, that are still being defined and expanded and trying to translate those into business processing rules that are relatively concise and don't completely traumatize our engineering team. Um, and we're also trying to, you know, take those into business processing rules, control flows, proofs of concepts. And navigating that is tricky because, you know, our compass is constantly changing, both because we were learning and because the landscape itself was just shifting beneath us. Uh, our North Star has been that the further we stray from the consensus, the less authority, the less credibility we have as enforcers. But where does that leave you when you're working pretty far out ahead of the consensus or that consensus left out some pretty major stakeholders um, like most users um, and certainly the engineers. So then there's, you know, in our case, there's the fact that privacy violations tend to be much more subjective than security violations. Um, that doesn't make them any less serious, but it means that they take a slightly different skill set to navigate um, and a different contextual awareness. So these are some of the bigger themes that have come up for me in the process um, and that I'm going to be delving deeper into. There's the what I call predictioneering, where we're working out ahead of the consensus. We're working with regulations that are still in development, rules that are still being made. Uh, enforcements that are still being hammered out among agencies. So we have to design and build for where we think the consensus is going to land and hope that we might even inadvertently create that consensus in the process. Uh, there's the fact that it's sometimes really difficult to trace and attribute privacy violations. Um, and in the cases where we can, there isn't necessarily a malicious actor on the other end, but there is certainly harm done. Um, so we don't necessarily have a clear bad guy in every case. Um, and sometimes, because we work in compliance, it's our clients that we catch slipping. Um, and so that makes it a lot harder to market. It makes it a lot harder to talk about our research and what we find. Um, and then another piece of this issue is what I call the Whitney paradox. The, it's not right, but it's okay. <laughs> Where uh, I know darn well it's not right, but it's not necessarily illegal, so I'm sort of powerless to do anything about it. Uh, it's, it makes it hard to find an angle that I can use to take action, and, and sometimes just feeling a lot like the sheriff from Jaws. Um, the title of this talk is a Jaws reference, um, because I watched that movie and I felt very strongly that it was weirdly relevant to my job. There's a misanthropic shark in the water, but no one wants to warn people or shut down the beach because if they did, they would lose money. Uh, and that's probably a metaphor that applies to a lot of our jobs at times and a lot of current events right now. It is hard to get people to care about risk until the worst happens. 
And by then it's too late for the people who get hurt. Um, there's also the fact that we are steering straight into the chaos, knowing full well that there does not exist a big enough boat and that it's our responsibility to improvise and build the tools that we need as we go. Um, and if you're lucky, there's also some rando who sings sea shanties, which in security, we have a few of those right now. Um, okay, so let's steer away from the JAWS references and dig deeper into some of those specific challenges that have come up. So I think building this part, our consent mismatch process, um, embodies the crux of the struggle within building for compliance. And of course, um, our work on it is never done. Our goal was to build a process that would operate client side to detect and block real-time violations of the IAB, Interactive Advertising Bureau's um, Transparency and Consent Framework, which is a framework for ad tech compliance with the GDPR. Um, and that's been so tricky because the TCF is by design a complex framework. It's designed to take advantage of every loophole there is. Um, and it needs to be interpreted in a way that is GDPR compliant. The GDPR is a new and complex and still evolving law. Um, and then there's the fact that the Belgian DPA seems to have ruled that TCF is not in fact compliant. The compliance solution it may or may not be compliant. We're still waiting for the test to settle on that. Um, so they're tricky to interpret separately. They're tricky to interpret together. Um, and again, it's all still in play, still evolving. Um, and the false negatives, they cost clients money um, because we're blocking things that didn't need to be blocked. But false positives allow these violations to slip by, which exposes them to liability, which can be much more expensive. So how we tackled it, ultimately, um, a lot of trial and error. Um, we created user stories, which might seem counterintuitive, but that's kind of what we've come down to. In trying to navigate this, um, we asked ourselves ultimately, if I were a user and I made this privacy selection on the cookie banners, which is what the transparency and consent framework encodes, um, what would my intention have been? What would I expect to happen? What would I hope to happen? What will I be really mad to find out happened instead? Um, and take those and move those into control flow diagrams and then brainstormed edge cases and then ultimately transformed that into a proof of concept um, and some actual code. Um, and again, we revised, we expanded these several times. We're still learning, we're still finding new weird edge cases and we're adapting. Um, and as a result, we have a surprisingly effective process. Um, the conclusions have been lar largely accepted by our clients. There's always pushback from the people who get caught violating it. That's to be expected. But it's held up to that pushback so far. Um, and of course, as everything continues to change and evolve, we're just going to have to continue to, to adjust and pivot and keep on our feet. Um, so this is a case of... Um, a violation that we found, it's a clear violation with clear harm done. Um, it is so hard to figure out what they gained from doing it though, <laughs> to a point where we're like, was it, was it a devious plot or, or was it just some unsupervised junior engineer who didn't understand the ins and outs of um, complex international laws? Very possible. So <laughs> what we found was for months, an ad tech vendor had a hard coded IAB framework um, or sorry, had a hard-coded consent string, which if you're not familiar, that's the data structure that consent management providers in this IAB TCF framework use to record a user's privacy selections after they interact with the cookie banners. Um, they're pretty high entropy encoded strings, um, and they had had an actual hard-coded string just sitting in their code um, and getting sent out in auctions. They occupy some weird esoteric middleman space in the adware supply chain. So they were sending this hard-coded consent string out left and right. It was sort of a generic accept all consent string. Um, and it's kind of hard to see. I mean, obviously it throws the legal basis for everyone who received that string and acted based on that string into question, which exposes everyone to liability and harms the user who may not have consented to, to what was done with their data. Um, but why? <laughs> why do this? What do they gain? I mean, it may be that like having this very friendly 
consent to everything consent string made their auctions more successful? It's possible. We don't know that. That might have, might have been enough. It might not have been. But this could also just be, uh, you know, just a hot fix for some bug or some error they were getting that they were trying to fix by setting a default. Or uh, maybe it was a bug in itself. Um, our developers with like a really haunted gleam in their eye raises possibility. <laughs> like, what if this was just some test string that actually accidentally made it out into production? Um, and now they're in deep doo-doo. Um, it's kind of horrifying. Um, the fact that they went to the trouble of creating this passively real string um, when they could probably have made do with a more random nonsense default or something that could never have passed for a string um, makes it pretty hard for me to give them that much of the benefit of the doubt. Um, but it's pretty easy to imagine that this could just be a mistake that slipped through the cracks because no one thought to look for it. Um, you know, it's not enough to have lawyers who check for ethical and legal violations on a higher level. You need product managers who know to look for them at the design and scoping stage and engineers who know to look for them in the review and QA stages. Um, if you're Google or Meta, you have specialists who review code for exactly this, but on smaller teams. Um, you know, it just needs to be part of your general technical workflow uh, because these little technical implementation decisions can have huge repercussions. Um, and so here we illustrate what I call the Whitney paradox, where I find something that I think is pretty wrong, but it's not really illegal. Um, and in compliance, it's hard to take action against something that falls in that frustrating gray area. Browser fingerprinting, it's a classic example for me. It's especially invasive. Um, it takes advantage of the things that make you and your browser settings more unique. So it makes the vulnerable more vulnerable. And sometimes it's just blatant, unhashed data collection just being sent back server side. Latitude, longitude, battery level, device motion, and all. Um, pretty invasive, freaky stuff. So even if a user opts out of tracking, there's this loophole where any, any entity can do that if they say that they are doing security or anti-fraud work. Um, it's a loophole built into the TCF framework and into the GDPR. And I believe there's something like that in the CCPA, although it's just not that explicit about this. So even if the user opts out of tracking, um, it, it's pretty hard to disprove that someone is doing security and IVT if that's what they say that they're doing. So, you know, when you're building good bots to go after bad bots, you do a lot of the same thing to avoid bot detection and you can end up doing looking a lot like those bad bots. And there's another gray area where the most jaw-droppingly invasive browser fingerprinting that I see is by security and anti-fraud vendors that I know and recognize as legitimate. Um, and it makes me seriously question whether security teams themselves are doing enough uh, to evaluate the privacy trade-offs and ethics of their tactics. Um, you know, if the trade-off is that you are slightly invading an individual's privacy to protect their data, I think that's a trade-off most users can understand. I can understand that to a point. Um, but if you're doing that to protect a company's money, I think you're operating in a pretty sketchy area. So <laughs> this is a case about trying to do the right thing ourselves without losing a client's trust, um, and also about building a technical solution very badly. So I discovered a dark pattern that was being used on consent banners that made it look to users like tracking was off by default, but in a hidden tab were a whole bunch of tracking settings that were on by default. So they thought that they could safely save their settings and not get tracked. In fact, they'd consented to a lot of tracking. That's a classic dark pattern. Um, I found it, it turned out to be quite widespread, but I initially found it on a client's site. So. Uh, to their credit, um, you know, we wanted to publish this research, raise the alarm about this going on, to try to put a stop to it, and to their credit, like, no one in my company once suggested that we shouldn't write about it anyway. Uh, but there's a lot of debate over language and how to write about it and how to walk that line. Um, and ultimately, we decided that if we weren't going to implement our client, we shouldn't impl implicate anyone specifically. Um, which was, and so we, you know, kept the screenshots as anonymous and general as possible. Um, it was a pragmatic choice, but without knowing what it was and who was doing it, there was a lot less interest and a lot less pressure on the parties involved. And I don't think that it was as effective as it could have been. 
um, and I still run into this dark pattern. Um, now, it may have crossed your mind that cookie banners are supposed to be a technical solution to an ethical problem. Uh, and indeed, they are. Um, but that doesn't stop people from trying to game the system. Uh, and I think in this case, it was probably designed with the intent of deceiving users. But that doesn't mean that every site that used what was a configuration of a third-party consent management platform library um, necessarily understood that it was a dark pattern. Uh, it may even have been a default configuration. It was that widespread. Um, and I found it because I was just trying to track down the cause of some weird consent strings because I couldn't figure out why anyone in their right mind would make the selections that they had until I went on the site and inadvertently um, fell prey to this dark pattern myself. Um, and, you know, I, if I had not put myself in the shoes of the user, um, because I wasn't that moment the user, uh, and fallen prey to that dark pattern, because I did, like, I probably would not have spotted the issue with that UI choice. Um, and, you know, that's the thing that I come back to over again, over and over again, when I'm struggling to align the ethical and the technical. Um, how would a consumer reasonably expect this to work? what would an end user assume would happen if they made that selection? And if your intentions are good and you're not trying to game your user, that should put you on the right track. Um, I think that's what ultimately, um, in the long run, guides consumer protection regulations. So the interpretation and legal precedents are always changing, but I think that they are always trying to evolve towards better consumer protection even if industry frameworks like the TCF are really built more for ad tech's best interest, not necessarily prioritizing the consumers. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Um, so particularly if you are an engineer, build some kind of ethical review or thought process into your workflow end to end. Don't ever assume that it's someone else's job um, it should be part of everybody else's, everybody's job to notice and raise this issue. And if people aren't comfortable doing that, then you have broader institutional problems. Um, and we should also be cognizant of the fact that engineers are in this position um, and train them better on some fundamental legal and compliance issues. Um, and to that end, if some important stakeholders were left out of the conversation about this product in really any stage, but especially in design and scoping, um, and especially if those stakeholders were your legal and compliance team, engage them. Don't be afraid to reach out and, and ask what may seem like a dumb question, because it may save you a massive publicity nightmare <laughs> and a massive legal nightmare and headache down the line. So. I think one of the stakeholders that has been mostly left out really has been the end users themselves. They've been left out of crafting these regulations. They've been laugh, left out of crafting ultimately the, the products that are making these big decisions about their privacy and safety. Um, and that may be, and I think a lot of them weren't even aware that these conversations were happening until very, very recently. And that may be changing, but we need to do more to engage and educate our end users, and we need to have, as engineers, a voice advocating for their interests um, when these tools are getting built, when the laws are getting written, and when the regulations are being enforced. Um, and as I keep saying, <laughs> when it comes down to it, when you're struggling to align those things, put yourself in the consumer's shoes, think about how they would expect it to work, and assume that the ARC is building towards stricter regulations and better consumer protections. And so building for the big picture, building in the long run, means building with those best interests already in mind. All right, so most importantly, don't do this alone. Whoops. So if you don't have help making these decisions, develop a sounding board of people you trust and who have different opinions and perspectives and are not afraid to disagree with you. I've been blessed to have the support of my boss, the security team, our product team, a really awesome product management expert who has a PhD in philosophy, super convenient person to have in your corner. Um, ethics is just too big for one person's perspective to be enough to get it right every time. This, this stuff is tricky. It shouldn't all be on you. So find the support you need and build yourself that bigger boat.
Thank you, guys. Um, So we have questions from two different avenues. We've got folks who are here today. I've got one here from Discord. Uh, and it just, I think it's sort of just pointing out the fact that not just lawyers, but product managers, engineers, et cetera, should look for those and violations of internal law. Yeah. So even if you're not an international entity, international people may find you, I think is what they're trying to say with that question. Yeah, I, it, that's the thing is, Nobody thinks it's the job of anybody but legal and compliance to work out for these things, but legal and compliance aren't necessarily reading your code. Um, I think in no cases are they reading your code. And that's where these slip ups happen. Um, that's where the mistakes that really cost you happen. So there has to be better communication um, and better collaboration between those teams. And if that's a training, if that's engineers and product managers being better equipped to help um, and I think that ultimately is the most practical solution, as annoying as that is for so many reasons, um, then so be it. Um, but maybe it also means some cross-collaboration of getting your legal team and compliance team better equipped to understand um, the technical side of what they're seeing um, so that they can be more involved in that process. Other questions? I'll pass the mic down here so folks online can hear. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, do you have examples of best practices, whether they be working groups or maybe examples of a role inside a company? Maybe it's an advocate type role or do you have anything else that we can look to beyond um, the examples you've given of product managers and you know people outside of just legal and compliance? Um, in my personal experience, it's hard to say because I work in a small enough company where we're all still wearing a lot of hats. <laughs> and so in many cases, I'm a few of those people. Uh, or, or a lot of people are involved in these conversations. And so it's less one person's role and more everybody's responsibility to keep it in mind and raise the issues when they see them. Um, one thing that surprised me actually today, you know, in throwing some vendors at Black Hat is that some of these, at least on the security side, some of these are supposedly automated and there are tools that are being built to do that on the technical side. And I can't speak to how effective those are as solutions, but it is it is an interesting possibility if you don't have the resources to hire those people, something to think about, um, a way to automate some of the, those role flows. I think I have a question from online that kind of dovetails onto that. Where can a company start in terms of offering training in these regulations to engineers and other members of product teams? Um, I think everyone, even if you don't have lawyers on staff, has had to consult with lawyers to craft your privacy policies and, and such. Um, and so I think finding legal teams or some people who are equipped to straddle that, we have a really helpful person um, she's a very experienced product manager. She's worked with um, Facebook and Instagram. She was there when, when the um, crazy Cambridge Analytica stuff went down and she has a PhD in philosophy and she's great at navigating this stuff and she is our go-to. She trains us and answers our questions. Um, but again, um, not everyone has that. I, I would say start with like, try to find a good lawyer who can talk to engineers. <laughs> And if necessary, find people who can who can make translations in between them. All right. Well, thank you. I think that actually brings us pretty much to the end awesome. of our time here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>